Good morning. This is Steve Scott from the Seventh Day Adventist Church in Fairfield. And uh, welcome to episode five of the Circle of Strength. This series is focused on Ephesians 6 11, putting on the whole armor of God. But first, a story. Come with me to this large patch of desert in northern New Mexico. And welcome to La Vida Mission. This is where I, where I grew up. It's right on the edge of the Navajo Nation. And for those of you that aren't used to seeing the bare bones of the earth in all their glory, this is absolutely beautiful country. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> now, most of these buildings were not there. In fact, only two of these buildings existed when I lived there. And the home that, we grew, that, we st that I lived in as, as a very young boy was down here. It's been destroyed. Uh, then we moved up here. It's been destroyed. Uh, those were all built back in the 1800s. And uh, then we lived in, yeah, there was a mobile home that used to sit up here, but it's been replaced. But this was my playground. Our nearest neighbors were five miles away. And mom said, you can play wherever you can hear my voice when I call you for supper. Now mom had a really strong voice, so she laid out the boundaries. We could play up to the edge of the bluff. We couldn't play over the bluff because she didn't think we could hear her up there. And we could play to the edge of the two hills that are right over here. We couldn't go past the two hills, but we could play over to there. So this whole territory, oh man, this was, this was, a, this was a, a boy's dream. Horn toads and lizards, cactus, and wild onions. We knew this place like the back of our hand. We found arrowheads, we found spent bullets. We even found a cannonball. Now how a cannonball got here, nobody could explain. My dad thought, well, maybe Kit Carson was in the area and was fighting Indians and fired a cannonball. But how, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, this was our playground. But you know, after you've lived someplace for a couple of years and you've covered all of this area, you want something new. You want something exciting. And we'd found all of those wonderful things, but one day we decided we wanted something new. Because you see, we had read that the Spanish came to New Mexico to find gold. If the Spanish found gold, but they didn't take it back to Mexico, they must have hidden it someplace, and we were sure they had hidden it someplace in our playground. And so we went looking for the Spanish gold. We were looking for treasure. Well, we looked in all of the places we knew that things could be hidden, and we dug and we dug, and we couldn't find anything. So finally we decided, okay, we've covered all of the usual places. Now we need to go all the way around the edge of our playground, and we need to check every place carefully, right at the edges, because we don't usually play there. So we got on the road and we walked around. There's the two hills, okay? And we came along the road and we got to where the two hills were. But we couldn't just go up to the two hills because there was a cliff there. What to do? Do we backtrack to where we can climb up and then come back? Or do we just go around the cliff like this? Well, my brother and I had this long conversation and we decided that going beyond the two hills did not include going on the two hills. So it was safe to go on the two hills, that was keeping the rules. 
And since the far side of the two hills was still on the two hills, we would be okay. We were still obeying mom. So we went around the edge of the cliff and we started walking up, very careful to stay close to the two hills and on the two hills. But as we did so, we saw something we had never seen before. There was water running down that little valley. Wow! There hadn't been any rain for weeks. What was water doing running down the valley? And so we stayed close to the two hills and we came up here, but we could see the water running in the valley and we came up and, and it was time to start turning back. But we, there was water running in the valley. This was unusual. It's kind of like a burning bush experience. And so Tom and I decided that just once mom would understand if we went to see this miracle happening in the middle of the desert. So we followed the running water and we came up to this little cleft in the valley and we found water bubbling up out of the ground. There was a spring there. And not just any spring. This spring was surrounded by thick, gooey clay. Now you have to understand, this is a desert. And in the Southwest Desert, Southwest Desert, you either have sandstone or lava. Now there's shale there too, and coal, but they're deep down in the ground. We had never seen, in all our playground, all our exploring, we had never seen clay like this. And so, all of a sudden, these visions of wonder. Okay, there's a spring. There's a new water supply. And maybe it doesn't have so much minerals in it that when mom cooks oatmeal, it tastes like rotten eggs. And maybe she'll be able to wash her silverware without it tarnishing the minute the water touches it. Wow, we found a water supply for the family. This is awesome. And we found clay. And all of a sudden, we were thinking, Okay, we can start making clay pots and selling them to help mom and dad. Because my mom and dad were volunteers out here. They didn't get paid. Okay? And so dad would all would have to go off and off the off and work for three months and then come back. Okay? Now if we could sell pots, dad wouldn't have to leave and he could stay there. It was so exciting. And but how do we take the water back? Mom and Dad won't believe us that there's water bubbling up out of the ground. And so, we made our first clay pot. And here it is. I still have this clay pot today. It's only about three inches high. And it sits in a treasure box in my garage. Okay, But we made this clay pot... I mean, it's absolutely exquisite, isn't it? We were so proud of this when we made it, okay? And it actually held water all the way back so that we could pour it out into a glass and show it to mom and dad. Mom, however, was not impressed. You see, when we started back and we came over the brow of the two hills, she was standing outside the house hollering for us and she saw exactly where we were and she knew exactly where we had been and she was not impressed with our story of the miracle in the desert. <coughs> My dad on the other hand was a little bit intrigued. Water running? There shouldn't be water running there. A spring? You're kidding. I've never heard of any springs around here. So after we ate supper, back to the two hills we went. We all got in, the whole family got in the pickup. We drove down here, parked but long, and walked up the valley. And Dad saw the water running in the valley, and we got up to the spring, and now Dad was excited. It wasn't just Steve and Tom. Dad was excited. There was water running. Because, see, we had drilled three wells. 
One went dry as soon as the rain stopped, and the other two had so many minerals in the well, my teeth are still mottled because of the drinking water that we had. He was excited. So, back down to the road we had went, back into the pickup, and he hightailed it over to the neighbor's house and said, Did you know that there's a spring on your property? Because the reason we weren't supposed to go past the two hills was that's where our property line ended. And we were supposed to show respect for our neighbors. And the neighbor said, oh yeah, it'll stop in a couple of days. But in two weeks, there'll be good, good pasture for the sheep there. And dad was kind of like, oh, you already knew about it. And we were kind of like, oh, our spring is nothing miraculous. Now, why do I tell this story? Why do I still have this clay pot in my garage all these years later? It's not a story I tell often. Okay? It's not like my snake story. I tell this story to myself all the time, though, because this story says to me, I am an explorer. I find new things unexpected things and I'm creative all of that's wrapped up in my story of the spring in the middle of the desert and going past the two hills stories give meaning to our lives what stories okay and I found out hang on Eric Whoops. Okay, hang on here. I gotta get the sound here. Okay, I found out that this story was more meaningful than I knew when I got this video chat on Marco Polo from my son this week. Okay. Early becoming the man that you always want. Okay. So see, my son knows my story even though I don't ever remember telling him this story. Okay. So what stories do you tell yourself over and over again? What stories do you trot out and tell other people the first time you meet them or when you come to church? And why do you tell those stories? I would suggest that we tell each other, tell ourselves and each other these stories because they impart meaning to our lives. They create our identity. They help build our self-worth. And they, they can be stories about skills that we have. Okay, I'm a hard worker. That's a great story for us guys, isn't it, Brian? Okay. I've got an education. I can still remember when one of my friends got her doctorate when she was 45. And the next time I met her, I greeted her like I usually did. And she said, 
that's doctor to you. She was very proud of the fact that she now had her doctorate and she wanted to be called doctor just like she called me doctor. On the other hand, I really didn't care if people called me doctor. Education was a part of my meaning of my life. Okay, and some people, the Confederate flag is really important to them. Because for my generation, a Confederate flag was a sign of rebellion against the establishment. It wasn't what a Confederate flag means today. So that's why we have this conflict, because we have different stories and different meanings attached to them. Oh, I'm wealthy. I'm a winner. I'm a family man. I like this one. Yeah, I wish I had that story. Okay. But there's a problem with every one of these stories. Most of them are good. Most of them are positive. Now, being a rebel can get you in trouble sometimes. Okay. Um, extreme sports, that can hurt. But most of these stories are good, but there's still a problem with them. And that problem is they all come to an end. Youth fades. Beauty turns into wrinkles. Muscles turn into flab. Education becomes obsolete. When I asked Vivian what gave her life meaning, she immediately jumped to her own stories. And she whipped off three stories for me right away about helping people taking care of me on my bad days when I can't, I can hardly walk across the parking lot, okay? Helping other people in her life gives meaning to her life. What stories do you tell yourself to bolster, bolster your self-image, to make you feel good about yourself, to emphasize that my life has meaning? People find meaning in many stories. What set me off on to, to talking about this today is after last week's uh, presentation, uh, I talked to my son-in-law about the difficulty that I was having and how everything was focused on psychosocial um, determinants of health. And he said, Steve, that's because we've neglected that for so long. But he said there are three things that people really need to have a good mental health. You have to have meaning in your life. You have to have self-control. And, and I, a sense of belonging. And a sense of belonging. Thank you, Vivian. Okay. But when I got to th thinking about what gives our lives meaning, and as Vivian and I were talking, I realized that very often that meaning is tied up with the stories that we tell repetitively. Jesus told a lot of stories. Yes, he quoted scripture, but he spent more time telling parables and, and giving illustrations. One of his illustrations I saw in action in Africa. Okay, See, in, in, when we were in Africa, when you harvested your grain, you didn't sell it. You had to store it because that was your food for the next year. And you had to try to store it in a way that kept it safe kept it safe from mice, kept it safe from bugs, kept it safe from thieves. And one of the ways that they developed is they would build these granaries out of mud bricks. You can see the mud down here, and then there's airspace underneath, and then there were mud bricks around, and then they plastered it all over with mud, and it was very effective at keeping out the rodents. However, if bugs got in ahead of time, then there'd be a lot of buggy grain at, when you took it out. And once the rains came, the mud would start getting soggy and rain so soaked with water. And so they'd have to tear this apart and move the grain inside or it would start to mildew. Jesus said, 
Don't store up your treasures here on earth where rust corrupts and moths eat them up. Store up your treasures in heaven for where your heart is, for your heart will always be where your treasure is. Where the Greek word that's translated heart here, in Greek, it wasn't just talking about the physical heart. The physical heart was where they thought our mind, our emotions, and our thinking processes happened. So, your heart will always be where your treasure is. Your emotional health and your mental health will always be attached to what you treasure and hold on to. Don't store, don't base your mental health on things here on this earth. He told another story, and as soon as I show you the picture, you say, oh yeah. Well, this was a story about two men who were building new homes on a floodplain. Both new men knew it was going to rain. Both, knew, both men knew the waters were going to rise. One man took the time to build his house on a firm foundation of stone. The other made do with firm sand. And what happened when the waters came? The house on the rock stood firm. <laughs> yeah, and the other one fell down. What did Jesus have to draw out of that? He said, anyone who hears and obeys these teachings of mine is like a man who builds his house on a firm foundation. What foundation are you building your mental health on. Jesus says, build your, build your house on my teachings. You know, it's a strange thing today. Studying the Bible has become obsolete. Now, I can understand that for people who are not Christians. They don't believe that the Bible is meaningful. But many of us Christians never touch our Bibles unless we're coming to church and then we carry it. But we never open it and read it. <coughs> if we never open the Bible and read it for ourselves, we are not building our lives on Christ's teachings. We're building our lives on what we are told in church. We're building our lives on sand. One more story from Jesus' life. Okay? A man came to him, and this story is difficult for me. A man came to him and said, Jesus, I want to follow you. But I can't until my dad dies. My family's opposed. Dad doesn't approve. I can't follow you until my dad dies. So I have to wait and bury my dad before I can come and follow you. And Jesus said something that sounds really harsh. Come with me and let the dead bury their own dead. Oh, makes my makes my, my, me chill, okay? If I said that to you, Jennifer, would you like me? Uh, I think you'd be really upset with me. And you'd let me know, wouldn't you? When the foundation of the meaning of our lives is on something that is transient, we're in a constant struggle. This story took on new meaning for me this week, okay? This isn't about, well, get rid of the family. No, this is, what are you building your life on? If the foundation of our mental health, our spiritual health, is transient, then we're in a constant struggle to hold on to that foundation, to keep it firm, to fix it when it starts to crumble, 
or to find another foundation. And our life is in constant flux because we're constantly trying to find another way to feel better about ourselves, to ease our pain, to prop us up, and to stay healthy. Jesus offers us a treasure that never molds, never rusts, never fades, a foundation sure and strong, that's secure and resilient regardless of the circumstances in our lives, present, past, or future. But to receive that treasure, we have to let go of what we're holding on to. We have to let go of the treasure of this world. <coughs> a monkey can't hold on to a coconut and grab a mango at the same time. In the same way, a man can't hold on to his identity. I'm a strong worker. That's what makes me worthwhile. And reach out and accept what Jesus has to offer him. And a woman can't hold on to, on to her identity as, I'm beautiful. That's what makes me good. Or whatever story you're holding on to, and reach out for what Jesus has to offer. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus, Jesus told him, you've got to sell everything you have before you can follow me. Everything. He had to sell everything that he held dear, that he based his identity on and drew security from. Does that mean all of these stories are meaningless? Not at all. But sin substitutes good things for eternal things. These are all gifts that God has given. Well, most of them. Okay? Most of these are gifts that God has given us. If you're a hard worker, that's a gift from God. But when our meaning, our foundation, our identity is based on the gift and not the giver of the gift, we're standing on shifting sand. We're setting up for ourselves for pain because He is our strength. When Paul wrote the book of 2 Corinthians, his identity was under attack. His apostleship was being challenged. There were people going around to the churches that he had founded, to the people that he had introduced to, to Christ and saying, you know, Paul, he really, he really, um, <clears throat> he, plays, he plays loose with the truth. He's falsified his credentials as an apostle. And chapters 10, 11, and 12 of 2 Corinthians are Paul's defense of his identity. And he goes through story after story after story of how he met Christ, of what Christ has done in his life, of all the things that he suffered for Christ. But then in chapter 12, when it comes to his summary, his final point, the strongest argument that he can think of for why he is an apostle. He brings out something that is so counterintuitive. He talks about the thorn in the flesh, the physical difficulty, illness, deformity, whatever it was that he had struggled with all of his life, that he had asked God to heal him, asked God to take it away, and the answer that he got from God was, my grace is all you need. Only when you are weak, and everything be done completely in my power. And Paul said, I celebrate my weakness. All of those stories of meaning were nothing compared to the power that Jesus brought to his life. 
So you're saying to me, okay, Steve, I get it. My beauty won't last forever. My muscles are going to turn to flab. Those high school football records that I set, they've all been broken. But what does Jesus have to offer me? Well, I'm so glad you asked. But we're out of time now. So next week you'll have to come back and we'll talk about that very subject. In the meantime, take the time this week to think about your stories. The stories you tell yourself every day. The stories that you bring out when you're struggling with your sense of self-worth, when you're feeling worthless and feeling like your life is meaningless. The stories you tell people that you meet to introduce yourself. This is who I am. Is the anxiety and depression that you struggle with in your life tied to the struggle to find meaning? to bolster your sense of self-worth, to define your identity, have the gifts that God has given you become the foundation for that meaning. I would suggest that Jesus is the answer to the problems that you're facing. I know he was to mine. So this week, just take a chance. Open your Bible and start reading. Start reading the teachings of Jesus. Matthew 5 is a great place to start. You get past the beatitude, I mean, get past all of the begats at the beginning and you start right with the teachings of Jesus, exactly where he said you needed to be focused. So, come to Matthew 5 and start reading. Join the crowds that have already gone there before you. Sit at Jesus' feet and learn from him. And, oh, by the way, just so you're clear, Jesus enjoys talking to women and children, too. They, weren't just, they just weren't as pushy as the men were when this painting was being made. Okay? So, I'll see you next week. Have a good one. <laughs>